Welcome to this brief session on the joints of the body. A joint exists at any point where two separate bones make physical contact. As we'll see, the ways in which this can happen differs greatly in their structure and their degree of motion. By far the most numerous type of joint, and the one of greatest significance in orthopedic medicine, is the synovial joint. To prepare for our discussions of orthopedic medicine, we'll give a general overview of joints and joint structure, then pay special attention to the general characteristics of synovial joints. There are multiple classification systems that can be used for joints, but one of the more general is related to their mobility, which recognizes three broad classes of joints within the body. Synarthroses are immovable joints. The concept of an immovable joint may seem counterintuitive, but synarthroses typically involve embryologically distinct bones that come together to reinforce an area of the body. A good example are the bones of the skull. As we learned in the previous segment, they are initially separated by mesenchymal fontanelles, but as the bones ossify, they ultimately come together to form an essentially fused calvarium to protect the brain. This is an example of bone-to-bone -bone contact, which is referred to as a synostosis joint. Synchondrosis are another example of an immovable joint. In this case, it involves a fusion of bones through hyaline cartilage. An example would be the epithelial growth plates we discussed in our session on bone tissue. You typically would not characterize growth plates as being joints, but by definition, they would qualify. Ampiarthrotic joints are considered slightly movable, allowing for a small degree of gliding and rotation. Fibrocartilaginous joints, like we see with the intervertebral discs, would be a good example. Diarthroses are freely movable joints and include the synovial joints of the body. It should be noted that freely movable is a subjective term, and there is a large degree of variability in the actual range of motion for synovial joints. Ball and socket joints, for example, have a wide range of motion. Now, while the gliding movements between the carpal bones are important, you're not likely to consider them to be as freely movable as the shoulder joint. Still, as these gliding joints are synovial, they are considered to be freely movable. While the actual biomechanic movements vary across synovial joints, they all have five characteristics in common. The first is the presence of a proper joint cavity that separates joint surfaces. This is not to say that they aren't in contact through ligaments and menisci, in particular when load-bearing, but there is a physical separation that exists between the joint surfaces that is not seen with synchondroses or fibrocartilaginous joints. The second characteristic is the presence of articular cartilage lining the two bone surfaces. This helps to minimize friction and inflammation while improving joint motion. Synovial joints are also surrounded by a joint capsule that fuses with the two bones in close proximity to the articulation. There are two layers to this capsule. The first is an outer fibrous layer of dense irregular connective tissue that serves to resist excessive distractive forces which would tear the bones apart. The inner layer is composed of a serous lining called the synovial membrane. It's responsible for the production of synovial fluid, which is another characteristic of all synovial joints. Synovial fluid bathes and nourishes the articular surfaces and serves as a lubricant to further minimize friction. Synovial joints are typically reinforced by ligaments. As discussed in a previous session, ligaments are made up of dense regular connective tissue. Ligaments can be either intrinsic or extrinsic. Intrinsic ligaments represent thickenings of the actual joint capsule. The medial and lateral collateral ligaments of the elbow would be good examples. Extrinsic ligaments are any reinforcing ligament that is not part of the joint capsule. In the knee, for example, while the medial collateral ligament is an intrinsic thickening of the joint capsule, the lateral collateral ligament is extrinsic, existing as an independent band. If you remember back to anatomy, the popliteus muscle tendon actually passes in between these two structures. Extrinsic ligaments can be further subdivided as being either extracapsular, appearing outside of the joint space, or intracapsular, being found within the joint space. The lateral collateral ligament is an example of an extracapsular ligament, while the ACL and PCL are both intracapsular. It's important to note that other structures can be associated with the synovial joint. These include menisci and bursal sacs, 
but their presence is variable and therefore not a universal quality of all synovial joints. The synovial membrane that makes up the inner lining of the synovial cavity is composed of loose areolar connective tissue and is highly vascular. The capillary network is fenestrated, containing prominent gaps between the endothelium to allow for mass diffusion of blood plasma, which makes up a large part of the synovial fluid volume. In addition to the fibroblasts typically seen in loose areolar connective tissue, the synovial membrane contains unique types of cell groups called synoviocytes. Type A synoviocytes resemble macrophages in appearance and function. They are found close to the fluid membrane interface and serve to clear foreign debris from the synovial fluid. Type B synoviocytes bear a close resemblance to fibroblasts. They contribute specific components to the synovial fluid, such as hyaluronic acid, which contributes to the fluid's special qualities. The synovial membrane projects onto the bone surface and is continuous with the articular cartilage. Articular cartilage is a non-traditional form of hyaline cartilage, lacking a perichondrium lining and possessing unique properties. The collagen fibers associated with the matrix project perpendicularly from the joint surface, where it is fused through a transitional calcified cartilage zone. As they approach the joint cavity, they gradually curve at a 90 degree angle, similar to the shape of a street light, so that the uppermost portion lies parallel to the upper cartilage surface and is reinforced through proteoglycan crosslinking. This creates a smooth surface for articulation with the articular cartilage on the other bone surface. The architecture also provides a small degree of cushioning and shock absorption. Remember that the collagen fibrils have some degree of flexibility, similar to that seen in the fiberglass pole vault. With pole vaulting, the jumper's weight loads elastic energy into the pole, which recoils to lift the jumper into the air. Similarly, compressive forces create a similar deformity in the collagen fibers, which then recoil to push back on the force. This further minimizes wear and tear on the joint surface. That concludes this session on joint structure and function and wraps up our discussion of normal musculoskeletal form and function. In the next session, we will start looking at clinical examples of abnormal morphology and disease processes. We'll start this journey with a look at connective tissue disorders.